listening to this lecture. Welcome everyone to DES 113. This is our typography class and if you can believe it, we are already in week three. This time has flown for me. It always seems to do that. How are you guys hanging in there? Are you feeling good about the software? Are you getting used to InDesign and Illustrator a little bit? I should say we've been mainly working in InDesign. So how, how are you feeling with it? Are we feeling comfortable? Do we have any questions? I'll go ahead and share the video and just give a virtual uh, shout out to everyone who has joined me today and who's watching from home via the recording. We're going to be jumping into our lecture and talking about all the things that we've got going this week. And last week, you had an assessment that um, was a quiz. So how did we do on that quiz? I, th I think everybody did generally pretty well, all things considered. So I was taking a look at everything and Looks like we've got a pretty good grasp. Uh, for some reason, this video is kind of shorting out, so give me just a minute and see if it'll, it'll do its thing. There we go. Hello, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, it looks like it doesn't want to want to work today, so we'll just keep it off. We'll just jump right into our lecture. For some reason, it's not uh, working. When I've got lots of programs open, it seems to be a little spotty. All right, so I am Mrs. Woodland, and we're going to talk about what is going to be expected for our week three. So this is our live session agenda. We're going to talk about week two a little bit. Did you receive your grading? Was, was there any feedback that you have questions about? So now's the time to ask questions if you're curious or some, confused or something didn't make sense. But everyone should, receive, should have received some sort of feedback. If not feedback in the comments section, please check the grading rubric along with where your grade has uh, stemmed from. So if you saw that you were deducted any points, check that. Now, I did want to remind you that I do allow one resubmission per assignment. So take the feedback with a grain of salt, make those changes, take the feedback and try to uh, critique it. Try to fine tune it a little bit, then resubmit it to me and you can get some points back on your assignment. I love doing that, like I talked about last week. I just, or I guess it was in week one where I mentioned that I, I love this because it gives me a chance to help you. I always learn better when I go back and change things and learn from my, my mistakes. But also, in this industry, you are going to have clients that may not see eye to eye with you. And in fact, I've got a client right now that I'm doing some work for and I mean, I've been, as a professional, I've been designing logos for uh, about a decade. And uh, yet they come back with these changes that are just like, oh, they're horrendous. But you know what? The client is right. And if that's what they want, then that's what they get. But it just kind of irks me a little bit because I'm like, oh, it's going to look terrible. Uh, you're ruining the work of art. But here's the thing. We take the critiques and we just get used to it because clients are never going to see eye to eye with us uh, generally. And uh, it's good it's good practice to get some feedback that says, oh, it wasn't perfect, but go make those changes and then, then you get your grade back. But if anything is confusing or wasn't clear, please let me know. I am happy to help. I also wanted to remind you, this week we do have an assignment and an assessment design project. So last week you only had one. This week we have two. And it's all going to be working in InDesign, and you have the option to work the a wedding invitation in Illustrator. Now, how many of you have looked at the assignments? Do we know what's coming up? Yes, and to go back to my comment earlier about my client, I had a student saying they should be paying you for your input because the experience and the background you have in the field, absolutely. So yes, clients do pay, um, but because they are paying clients, generally you want to make them happy. So not all clients will trust you, not all clients will, um, uh, I don't know, I, what's, what's the word, not all clients will... Uh, see eye to eye with your vision and usually they have a vision in mind a very specific one that they want captured so it's kind of your job as the graphic designer to capture their vision and not yours so with that aside you kind of get a taste for getting feedback and and it's not always you know you think you've 
in my case, I thought I designed something amazing, something great, something very highly effective. And it was, but it wasn't what they wanted and it wasn't how they envisioned it. So we go back to the drawing board and we make those changes and we keep them happy. So believe it or not, you're going to run into that. So whether it's an employer who wants you to redo something or a client uh, or an instructor, it's great practice. So I love giving feedback and then having you make those changes. It's just good practice. So. But absolutely, you are definitely right on that. They do pay you. And that's why we're here in school, right? Because we are going to get paid for what we do. We're developing these talents so that we can make some money. All right, let's talk about our discussion a little bit. Now, I, I asked earlier, have you guys had a chance to look at what we're doing this week? Or is this all, all going to be uh, new for you? And I'm happy to review it. I just want to get an idea who's looked ahead. And if you haven't, that's okay. Usually lectures kind of give me an introduction to what we're doing. So if you haven't had a chance to participate in the discussion for week three, please do. Uh, this is how I take class attendance since this is an online course. It's really hard to say who was present, who wasn't. But if you are present in the discussion, this is a great way to get attendance points. And what I mean by that is you can't make these submissions up. So if you missed it for the week, you, you're not able to resubmit late. So, and that's not my policy. That's college policy, um, unfortunately. But that is just kind of the way that I see who has been active in class and who is actively participating. So going back to the discussion, if you haven't done it already, take a look at it. It talks about the career relevancy, doing research. You're going to be critiquing. If you've noticed, there's a pattern here. They have you research a topic, whether it's a font or a designer or, or um, a situation, and then they have you evaluate. So in this case, what you find is going to be an integral part of the professional's design process. So if you can dissect examples of the type of work that you need to create and evaluate what makes it successful or not, then you'll be able to incorporate that into your own successful design. So personal invitations are an interesting design area to study, and we're going to be designing one for this week, and I'll demo that today. They can be presented digitally or in print. So if it's a wedding invitation, generally they're designed digitally and then they are printed out. Um, if it's a party to a barbecue, it's kind of trending now to just do those evites, right? You design something digitally and have them sent out digitally. Uh, not always are invitations printed unless it's a, like a wedding or a shower, but they can follow traditional formats or they can be influenced by trends. And so it's kind of up to you to do that research, see what's trending. Um, it depends on the place, people who are hosting the event. There's a lot of factors that go into the design and overall look of the invitation, but either way, a successful execution will depend on how well it communicates the information that's being presented. So, and, and you'll hear me use a word hierarchy and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but successful hierarchy and organization will be created by using typographical techniques and applying all the design principles that we've learned. In this week three, you have a course media section on the homepage that you are to be learning and studying up. It's kind of independent study. It goes into the 19 rules of typography. And so you will be held responsible for that knowledge. So please learn the rules. They will greatly help you. And I always tell my students, you've got to know the rules before you can break them. Because I don't always follow the rules in my designs, but I'm a seasoned professional who's been doing this for a long time. So once you understand the rules, you understand how you can break them to make a good design. Um, but again, it's important to know the rules and follow them until you get a really good strong handle on the design process. So type techniques and design principles, we'll get into that. But you're going to be talking about contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. We're going to go into this today so you kind of get a feel for what these weird words mean. But there's also a visual on the discussion three page that will kind of explain it. In, uh, in a visual way, uh, but also we, we're going to go into uh, what's proximity, what's, uh, how do you create unity in an invitation, and why is it important to know and create hierarchy uh, through several different aspects like contrast, size, color, shape, and placement, and we'll get into that in our, in our lecture. Um, I'm going to try to reserve a good portion of it doing the design, the assignments, and then we're going to go into our lecture so those of you who are on the East Coast that can't stay, we'll do lecture during the, um, 
a second half probably. This is just doing some housekeeping. Okay, so for our assignment three, you are required to create an invitation, a wedding invitation. Have you started on it? Are we feeling good about it? You're going to be asked to combine two typefaces to achieve contrast and to create hierarchy in text. You're also going to need to utilize five typographical techniques to create hierarchy. So basically, you're going to have to do some research on event invitations to kind of see what's out there. And um, I'll go get into week two in just a minute, but I wanted to talk about week three. So if so, you can do a good job and make your client happy, like we talked about, getting connected. Um, it leads to more work, uh, usually, trying to capture their vision. But again, it's all about what they want and what they need. So we're going to learn techniques, how to create hierarchy in text. We're going to do a practice, a uh, little demo. Uh, and then I'm going to set you free to do it, too, because I want to make sure that we are kind of working alongside each other. So. Again, we'll get into combining fonts to create hierarchy, but this is what you're going to be doing, creating an event invitation for a wedding for assignment three. Now, assessment three is a little bit different, and it's going to be similar to what you did last week with the body text. You are going to create a an article. Uh, let's see. It's a one-page article layout, so you're going to apply uh, punctuation, special characters. You're going to make it aesthetically nice as far as layout's concerned. But basically, you're just going to be graded on how well you address the, the typesetting standard. So it's just following instructions and implementing them. Headline, byline, body copies, subheadings. You're going to have to include all these elements. And there's a list for you under the assessment. So don't worry about that. But it's very similar to what you've been doing. So don't let these, these terms uh, confuse you or throw you off a little bit. It's basically what you've been doing the last two weeks. It's just another exercise. All right, let's back up a little bit to week two. So everyone should have had grades turned in and had commentary and feedback given. If you did not get any feedback, let me know. If you had a perfect score, there's a reason for that. There won't be much feedback on perfect scores. Late submissions for week two work. It's okay to get it to me by the end of this week. This is the deadline for this Saturday for week two work. Late assignments are usually graded by the end of the week. So if you turn it in late, uh, plan on two or three days before you'll get a grade. Generally, I only grade on the weekends so that we have time to get those turned in. But the quiz should be reopened. So if you want to go back and retake it, you can. If you miss the quiz, I know a few of you, there was a handful that missed taking the quiz. Please go back and make sure you take it so that you can get any points is better than zero. So um, please note that week one assignments are now closed. So there will be no late submissions for week one work uh, or resubmissions, anything that you are reworking. The deadline ends after the uh, one week deadline. And just contact me if you need to make up any work. So stay in communication with me. I get it. Life comes up and things happen. You just got to stay in touch with me, okay? All right, uh, we talked about discussion two. We won't get into that too much because we've got some design stuff that I want to get into. Uh, week three overview, we kind of talked a little bit about what assignment three was going to be. Assessment three is going to be typesetting choices. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. We got into our week three discussion. Please be aware that most of you lost points because you were not posting uh, those peer commentary posts. So make sure that you comment on at least two uh, peers. And also um, make sure that you are asking questions, that you're engaging in the discussion and keeping it going. Um, it, don't just post your information and your research. Ask some questions. This is how we keep the discussion in the forum going, and you get points for that. So, are there any questions so far about previous weeks or this week? Are we feeling good? All right, so let's talk about week three's assignment. So like we talked about, it is a wedding invitation. 
And what you're going to need to do is choose a client. So there's a lot of information in the explanation, but I'm just hoping to kind of simplify things so that you're not overwhelmed or, or bombarded by a lot of information that you see. So first of all, can you see my slides? I want to make sure you can see my slides. Let me stop the share real quick. There it is. Okay, so you're going to want to choose a client. You want to research mood and styles. You'll also want to use Illustrator or InDesign. I'll let you choose which one you feel more comfortable with. Which one do you usually like to use? I know for a while I was really comfortable with InDesign when I was in school, so I, I did everything in InDesign until I kind of branched out to Illustrator and I realized that it can do a lot more. But you're welcome to use either one of those two. And uh, let's talk about uh, the demo will be an illustrator today, just so that you're aware. Uh, make sure you follow the specs. Color can be used and a monogram can be, uh, it needs to be included. And I'll do a demo on how to create a monogram for those of us who, who aren't familiar. <laughs> InDesign typically hates you halfway through a project. Perfect. Well, the demo is in Illustrator, so we are going to do that. And the only reason why I do recommend InDesign for anything that you have to typeset, uh, anything that has a lot of type or, or text, but Illustrator is, um, is great for monograms and because it's kind of like a logo. And also it's, it's just, it's, I think it's a lot easier for this assignment personally, but I'll let you decide. The demo will be in Illustrator today. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and pull up Illustrator. I'll get into more lecture stuff in a minute. I just want to kind of dive into the assignment, kind of get it over with real quick so that we, we are, are comfortable with what we have to do. I want to make sure everyone's feeling good. And because there is a lot to cover. And this is the big one, so I want to make sure we all get good a good grade on this. All right, if you bear with me for one minute, usually when I have multiple programs open and then I run Zoom, everything freezes on me. So I'm going to... Attempt to expand this. Okay, so here's a sneak peek at a, a wedding invitation. And I'll show you how this was done. But again, this assignment, you're going to be designing a typographic wedding invitation for a fictitious couple. You'll get to choose. There's different scenarios so that you can apply the techniques that you've learned to create hierarchy using only words and letters. So when you're designing an invitation, it's very important for it to have a voice and a theme. In this case, um, I picked some random um, random names, and this one is used for a more fancier kind of black tie wedding affair here. So I just went with straight black and white. You can add color, um, but please be aware there are no graphics and no illustrations, and I believe no pictures or clip art, no images can be used. So it's Basically, where only type can be used, so no images, graphics, or clip art. So we're going to be using, which forces us to get a little bit more creative, I think. So um, I'll show you how, I'll demo how to do this real quick. It's just a matter of creating hierarchy, and we'll go into that in our lecture in just a minute. I just wanted to show you. And actually, I need to probably create a new document because uh, we're going to start this from scratch. All right. So let's create a new document. And we are going to be an illustrator today. If you look, if you can pull up the listed specifications on your assignment three and kind of read along with me so that you, in case I'm reading out values a little too quickly. But if you'll go to File, New. The size will be A7 enclosure, and you're going to want portrait or landscape, but this will be one-sided. And again, please bear with me while my computer sits and thinks. 
it's going to spin its wheels for, for a little bit, but hopefully this gives you a chance to get yours up and running. Uh, ben, will you be following along with me today or are you going to uh, try to, or are you just going to watch? I generally like to go slower if you're going to be following along. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I will go a bit slow. This will be a portrait orientation. Please make sure that you change the, uh, the dimensions. So the width, they give this to you all in the assessment, but it's um, 4.75. And then the height is 6.75. So it's just a matter of plugging in those, those specifications. Make sure inches is your unit of measurement that's being used. Exactly. So if you can follow along, that'd be great. Otherwise, you can always remind me later. And remember, let's title our assignment according to the, the submission instructions, which is DES113 underscore. This is, um, let's see, I want to make sure. Assessment three. And then you'll put your first and last name. This helps me when I'm grading so I can keep things straight. So please remember to do that. So then you'll just save it with the submission instructions. And then uh, let's go back to the, uh, I don't think there's any other specifications for this. So we will just we wanna make sure our color mode is on CMYK. So you'll kinda, if you don't see the advanced options, there's a little drop down menu here uh, highlighted. You'll click that and it will op open up a few more options for you. So just make sure your color mode says CMYK. Other than that, you can hit create and we are good to go. Give it a minute, it will pop up. So not too bad, right? Compared to the assessment, you'll have a lot of typesetting uh, specifications that you have to follow, but this one was pretty simple. Just make sure you have the page size correct. And you can choose portrait or landscape. There we have it. So we are in portrait view. Okay, and then it's just a matter of picking a couple. So if you'll wanna go to the website and download some information. I'm gonna highlight this and bring it in to show you. This will save a lot of time instead of me formatting all my text. Now this I designed earlier. What I'm gonna do with my layers is I'm going to have uh, this layer, I have this layer locked. I'll create a new layer and that's where I'll paste my, my elements that I'm gonna be grabbing from. Okay, so what you see here, this MR, this is basically my monogram. Now, we can get into what's a monogram and we'll talk a little bit more about it. But if you want to personalize something with your initials or maybe just give it an extra special something, um, you basically are going to go to, uh, you're going to lean towards a monogram and especially for a wedding invitation, uh, any personalized gift or any invitation, there are going to be ways to leave a mark um, like from wedding dates to meaningful quotes but a classic monogram will always win as the most popular way to personalize uh, any occasion or any invitation. So just make sure that you kind of follow the proper steps. So personal monogram usually consists of two to two or three initials, your first, middle, and last names. So if someone doesn't have a middle name, they often use a dual initial monogram or maybe opt to use their last name initial only. So a man's initials usually don't change. The exception is if he and his spouse use a hyphenated last name after they're married. We don't, you won't have to worry about that in these situations, but it's just interesting to note because a woman's initials, however, they're more likely to change once she's tied the knot. Up. So traditionally, anyways, they usually shift their maiden name to their married name. But tradition isn't the only way, and some couples are using both last names with hyphens. And so it's important to kind of stay abreast of what 
the trends are and how there's a lot of rules with monograms, but many couples choose to monogram items like uh, using both of their initials. But in this case, I am using M and R because it's Martha and Robert in this case. Um, normally, you you would probably do M, W, and R, C, or you would do, you know, what, whatever you feel the need to do. But in this case, I just found a nice font and I kind of expanded it. And that becomes my art. So I'm making the monogram kind of the centerpiece. Now, we, I'll go into a demo on how to create different monograms if you want to learn to create a very custom one. But in this case, I just kind of made the letters big. So Martha and Robert are is the monogram initials. So there's lots of different types of monograms. There's um, most monograms can be divided into basically two main categories. So monograms where letters are all the same size, like in this case, and monograms where the center initial is usually larger like this. And I'll show you. So uh, for Martha Jane Williams, it'd be MJW. And then change the font to something else. There we go. Let me expand this so I can show you an example. So usually the middle initial will be a little larger, kind of stand out like that. Maybe not quite that large, but you know, significantly larger. There we go. And, uh, or they will be all the same size. So that's another way to do it. If the monogram features a larger center initial, the ordering is always first name, last name, and middle name. So um, we just kind of need to make sure you have the order. Uh, but you could make it a more straightforward block style. But the larger center initial style is almost always used for joint couple, joint or couple monograms. So um, you could do simple monograms. They kind of made made way for more elaborate designs but if you're ever curious of what to monogram we can go into that later but I just wanted to make sure that we're, we're familiar with the style so you can either do a letter that's larger in the center or you can do them all the same size like that all right so in this case, I kept them all the same size and I made them the center of the page. So the way I did that was I just click and drag your text box. MR was the first and last name. And then will, uh, Cooper will be the middle name. So I can even do a third one. So this will be uh, Martha, Robert, and then Cooper. I will highlight this. And then you, it's just a matter of finding a font that works for you. Uh, something I found something kind of uh, fancy. There are a few fonts you want to steer clear of because you do, it's just dated or perhaps it's not as um, trending. So I'll find the example. I think it's Apple Chancery. Do not use Apple Chancery, please, or anything that looks like it. This one is done to death and students always gravitate towards it for some reason, but there are so many out there. And and we're encouraging you to use Typekit as well to find some really nice fonts because, again, you, your options are endless, so there's no need to use, um, use that. Okay, so in this case, I just picked a font. So MRC is the uh, initials. Now, I can choose to make this a little larger. like this, or I can keep them all the same. But I'm kind of liking, this font doesn't work for that uh, kind of design, so I'm just gonna make it all the same size. Now, what I usually like to do is once you have your initials typed out, I'm gonna go to Type, Create Outlines, do you see that? 
And by doing that, it no longer allows me to edit it with the type tool, but it kind of creates a vector. So we're going to ungroup this, and now I will be able to move the initials around separately. So this will allow me to give more of a custom look and feel to my, my monogram, okay? So you can kind of just play around with it and see, see what works. Once you like the placement of your elements, scoot that one in a little bit, you can uh, select them all by clicking and dragging on your screen or Apple, or sorry, Command A will highlight everything, um, but usually clicking and dragging with the mouse will work. And I'm just going to expand this. The way that you expand it proportionately is holding down your shift button as you click and drag. Holding down shift will help you constrain the proportions so that there's no stretching like this or skewing. Um, we don't want any squished fonts. Uh, we don't want anything that's super wide. We want to make sure we maintain the integrity of the font or the typeface, okay? So in this case, this will be my, my uh, main art. And then uh, it's just a matter of plugging in your information. Now, they did ask that you use two contrasting fonts. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I don't necessarily love the extra initial. Um, contrasting fonts. Let's look at these two fonts that I'm using. A contrasting font is something that looks dramatically different. So the type of font that I have for Martha Jane Williams, and I'll zoom in here so you can see it a little bit better. This is what kind of font? Is it serif or sans serif? Any guesses? So the font that I used for her name is a sans serif font, which means it doesn't have any extra feet or frills or anything to it. So it's a very clean, straightforward, modern, contemporary look. Now, to contrast that, I picked a very fussy font. So this one's kind of no fuss. This one's very fussy. They contrast well with each other. Um, if I were to pick another sans serif font, there would be no contrast whatsoever. So please make sure that you, you're using two different fonts. Um, and make sure they complement each other, but also they do need to contrast. So another way that I could have contrasted Martha G, or the sans serif font would be by using a serif font. But I liked the look of this italic. Um, now please be aware if you're going to use italics in your invitation, to make it to find an italic font that is legible and maybe don't do everything in italics. That's why we want that contrasting font. So if you have a lot of information in a block of text, don't make it all italicized or handwritten. Please make sure it's legible like we talked about in last week's exercise when you did the paragraphs. So in this case, this one is Edwardian script. I just grabbed a, a nice legible italicized font and this will contrast nicely with this Galaxy Polaris font. It's just a sans serif font. Now it's just a matter of spacing. Uh, we don't want things too close together. We don't want things to spread out. Otherwise it looks disconnected. So there's a word that we like to use called proximity. When something is close together, you assume that they are part of a group. When they are separate from each other, you assume that they are not part of that same, not part of a group. They're not unified. So with proximity, we want to make sure that similar information is grouped together. So the names would be considered similar information. So you'll put this content here. And something that's very helpful when you're laying out invitations or anything with text or anything at all, really, it could even be a logo, you'll want to go to view and scroll all the way down and make sure your smart guides are turned on. What smart guides do is it allows you to kind of lock things in place and it will tell you where the center of things are. So these purple magenta lines will kind of, as you can see below here, it's lining things up for me right now. It's telling me where the center of the page is. So I'm just gonna follow those smart guides and make sure that I'm um, 
using them properly and this will help me line up my information. Now I'm, I'm kind of spacing things out nicely. I have this whole page to use, so I really don't need, um, I, you know, I can take up the space. Now the assignment does ask for us not to use graphics or anything like that. But what I like to do to kind of divide text, because you don't want it very text heavy, you want things to break up the text. Whether you use proximity or uh, something else, I want you to try to think of creative ways that you can use elements within that text. So I'm just using a line. You can draw a line to create division. So grab your line tool, hold down shift, click and drag. That line tool will add a nice divider. And I'm just trying to keep everything kind of evenly spaced. What's neat about using the line tool, if you've never, have you used it in Illustrator before? Any of you? If you've used the line tool before, you'll know that you can go up here at the top where it says stroke, or you can go to window, scroll down to stroke, and it will bring up your stroke options box. Whoops. There we go. And your stroke options box will allow you to adjust the heaviness or the weight of your invitation. We don't like to go too heavy on these lines. So I like to stay generally around half to one full point. And then you do have the option to kind of round corners if you want. Uh, the profile down here below can give you a different look. So if it's selected, You won't be able to tell until you expand it as to what it's doing like that. But again, we don't want any design element that's going to steal away, take away the show from the text. The typography really needs to be the star of the show here. I'm just merely trying to group text in a way that reads nicely and has breathing room, kind of breaks up mundane parts of the invitation. Another thing that you can do, so this line, what this line is doing is it's serving a purpose, two purposes. One, it's acting as a visual, something graphic on your page without using a graphic. It's also breaking up the text. It's kind of blocking it and helping me create proximity. So it's, it's separating the names from the actual event invitation and so, uh, the, or event information, and that's very key and important here. So again, I've got my, my uh, text that I've already typed in. Make sure punctuation and everything is correct. And then at the bottom where it says RSVP or reception to follow, this can all be at the bottom and can be small. Now, it does look like I need something because it's, uh, you know, we got a lot of space. So there's a few things you can do. I'm going to just simply bring this up and I'm going to copy this line. I'm going to hold down my alt option button and I'm going to drag it down evenly between these two blocks of text. So that gives me a little bit of uh, division there. I can even make it hold down shift when you resize anything that will constrain the proportions. I'm going to make this one a little smaller so it looks like there's some tapering going on to the invitation and I like that, that kind of that pyramid look. I'm also going to bring these down to the center a little bit. Not too much white space at the top, but you get the idea. And there's my invitation. So I also have some other, you know, frilly things. They say you can use what's in your, your, your typeface font. So again, I've showed you this trick last week, but if you click and drag a text box and you go to your type and drop down menu, there's a word called glyphs. Glyphs are these extra hidden characters within a font, and oftentimes they have little graphics and things that you could use to create some embellishments on your invitation. And so I love using these. Each font will be different and offer you a different set of embellishments. So go to one that's been around for forever, like Times New Roman. They've got a lot. They've got a heart, music notes, and, and things like that. And so you could... Um, you can either use these embellishments, you can just scroll down, I mean the list is forever long. Or search a different font, I don't know, Wingdings has some stuff, let's see. Uh, there's some neat little, you know, characters and embellishments this way. 
here's one. So if I double click and then double click there, I'm going to use those two. If you don't see it, it just means your font's too, too big. So I'm going to shrink it down. So I'm going to use this little embellishment. And go to type, create outlines, and that will vectorize them. And I'm just going to kind of bring it down here. I want it small. Again, we're not going to make anything gigantic because we want the type to stand out. So there's that little embellishment there. And I think that's all this invitation needs. So my contrasting font is using, this is Galaxy Polaris. It's the same font, sans serif font, except I am using a different, uh, different styles within that font. So I'm using a regular uh, font here, whereas I have a bold up here. And I'm also using lowercase here, whereas I have uppercase up here. So I'm, uh, even though I'm using two different fonts, I'm also using the font styles within the font family to help me create that contrast. And I used a very clean font for the large body of text so that it was uh, more legible and easy to read. Are there any questions about this uh, invitation? I, I may do another one if we have time. I just want to make sure we're, I'm not going too fast. Okay, let's jump back over here to, uh, we'll do this one in a minute. All right, there's different ways that you can create a monogram, lots of different things you can do. We talked about making the middle initial larger than the flanking initials. Um, there's intersecting where you can kind of, kind of move them into each other. Uh, let's see. There's different effects that you can do. If you take a, a font or two initials and go to type, create outlines, it's no longer editable with the type tool, but it now becomes a vector. So you'll ungroup them. And you can kind of bring this in. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. So they're still touching. So each one's kind of overlapping each other. And if you select them both by holding down shift, you can open up your Pathfinder tool, and the way that you find that is go to Window, drop down Pathfinder, and you can play with intersecting, whoops, or divide. And when you click divide, what that does is it creates each overlapping piece, it creates its own puzzle piece, basically. So the way I'm going to tackle this. I'm going to grab, oops, I'm going to grab each anchor point. I can actually delete anchor points. So I'm going to grab my delete anchor point and I'm going to zoom in here so you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to just click on each one just like that. And now this will kind of allow me to. kind of play around with the anchor points a little bit and kind of see if I can get them to, to fit in. I can also grab the pen tool. And I can add some points if I needed. I'm just basically rounding out this bottom area. There we go. You can also grab the eraser tool and kind of play around with um, the size. Like that. We'll kind of erase and you create a tapered look. You can also use the smooth tool. So if you select your 
your letters and grab the smooth tool and then kind of try to connect them a little bit. There we go. All right, so then when you zoom out, you've got connected letters, and that kind of gives you a cool illusion. There's also another effect that you can do. Am I spelling out the date and font? Um, in this case, for my wedding invitation, that's just how the text um, was, but you're gonna use the document that's given to you. So however they have it laid out, if it's in a number format, use the number. If it's in a text format, use the text number, or the text, but good question. Yeah, in this case, I just grabbed some, some text and put it in there, but um, whatever the doc, depending on the couple that you choose, their document will look a little different, so. Great question. So there's that monogram style, two letters connecting each other. Um, there's one where you do missing part. So you can grab two letters. And again, you're gonna use the Pathfinder tool to create this effect, but I'll zoom in here for you. And with your Pathfinder tool open, you'll go to type create outlines. Ungroup, you'll right click, hit ungroup, and then you'll just kind of move these into each other if you want. Or what I like to do is, in this case, I want to kind of dissect this A. I'm going to grab a rectangle tool and I'm going to rotate it the same angle that the A is on. So I might need to squeeze us, uh, you know, move it in a little bit. And it might take a little bit of tweaking to get the right angle. Okay, and then I'm the idea here is to get as far into that A as possible. Perfect. So now I've got that box over the A. I'm going to go to divide again. And now I can delete little portions of wherever that overlapped. So I'm kind of cleaning up the house here. So now I've got half my A. And I can squeeze that in now. Almost so it becomes part of the Y. like that. So that's kind of a cool effect if you want to do a monogram like that. And let's look at one more before we go to break. You can do the interlocking, like the S and the O kind of interlock, interlock each other. So I can grab two more letters. Again, we'll go to type, create outlines. Right click, ungroup, and then this way it will kind of allow you to move them over each other. You can do black or if you wanted to do color, this is a little bit, takes a little bit more steps, but if you wanted to do color, you basically would make one light, one dark. And then you would highlight them and do divide again. And then zoom in here so you can see what it's doing. The center piece here, I can delete or just change that to blue. So it looks like that S is going over the O, but it kind of wraps around. So by clicking divide, it turns each intersecting section into its own little puzzle piece so you can kind of make those edits that way so that's a very simple way to do a monogram if you wanted to do it like that so here's three different options that I've presented you on the monogram style and there is kind of a you know a little bit more uh, I should say contemporary look which is doing a kind of like an envelope distort like this which is really cool if you were to do a monogram with the initials. So in this case, my initials are right here and you can kind of create a really cool effect. Very simple to do, only a few steps. So I'll step you through it and then we'll go to break.
So what uh, I, I've created some shapes here just for sake of time, but if you just pick a shape and draw it, give it a color, and then you're gonna wanna type out some words. So in this case, I can use my initials or you know whatever you want. In this, this would be four initials. So in this case, this would be a four letter initial for um, the name. And what I like to do is take, a, in this case, let's use the heart. And I'm just gonna put the heart over the text. Now, if your text is sitting above your heart, I recommend that you right click the t or uh, click on the text, right click, and go to arrange, send to back. We want it to be on the back layer. And then you'll uh, select your heart and your text box, and go to type. I'm sorry, object. Envelope distort, make with top object. So if you follow me, whoops. Let's try it again. So if you select both your type box and your shape and go to object, envelope distort, make with top object, it should create something like this. I don't know why it's giving me trouble. Let me, let me try it again. By the way, I got the heart from using the glyphs. So I went to type and I went to glyphs. And I went to Times New Roman because they have a heart already. You can draw your own, but I figured probably easier. Okay, let me close out of the glyphs. There it is. So right now it's text, it's type, it's editable with my type tool, but I need to create a vector out of it. So I'm gonna go to type, create outlines, and then I'm gonna give it a color, hold down shift, and I'm gonna expand it. I'm gonna place it over my text. Gonna make it nice and large. And then I'm gonna select my type, and my heart and go to object, envelope distort, make with top object. And for some reason it's not letting me. I need to make sure my layers are correct. Let's see. Let's try this again. I was doing it earlier and it was giving me this error, so I'm gonna see why it's giving me. Let me try it with a circle. Maybe it doesn't like the heart. I'm also gonna lock my artboard, just so. All right, so we want to send this to the back. Behind by circle. Select my circle, go to envelope, make a top object. There we go. For some reason, it didn't like my heart. Um, okay, so there's your effect. So that's kind of cool and fun. Um, it gives a really cool envelope distort to it. So if this was initials, like in this case, it's a really cool custom look with only two steps. So I put it up here for you so you can see. Hopefully you don't run into the same problem I did. For some reason, it wasn't liking my heart. Um, but you just go to arrange, send it to the back layer, the text, and then go to object, envelope, distort. So this gives you a really cool effect. Now, if I were to try it with, let's do the diamond. I'll put it over here. I'm gonna make it just a little bit bigger. Okay, so we're going to kind of just center it. I'm going to move my shape to the front, select both boxes. I'll go to object, envelope, distort, make with top object. So there you go. So in this case, it's not as cool with the initials. So I wonder if it would give me a better effect if I used the word wow. So let's put the word wow there. 
And just for repetition's sake, we'll go through the steps one more time. Because I want to make sure you guys have this down. It's a very simple, effective trick to create a monogram. So I'm going to select the shape. Shape has to be in front. So I'm going to go to Arrange, Bring to Front. I'll select both the text box and the shape, and I'll go to Object, Envelope Distort, Make with Top Object. So it looks a little cooler depending on what the letter or the initials are. Don't necessarily love it with my initials, but um, this is kind of a neat, neat effect. So you've got uh, this, and I'll have to try the heart again. I'm not quite sure why it wasn't, wasn't working. Um, but this one's neat. There's another way to do it. If you, I'll back up a little bit. Now, if you did your envelope distort, but you still want to edit your text, you'll go up here to the top where it says envelope top. Do you see that? See where it says envelope top, right in, right where my setting settings bar is. If you click on edit contents right here, try to point to it. It's kind of like the star. This will allow me to highlight my text and change it. So I can change the initials to MRM or just one letter, or if I wanted two letters, or put my initials in there. So it allows you to edit the text still, which is really cool. The step I'm going to show you after does not let you edit the text, but it gives you a really neat effect. So I'll finish, I'll change this to wow because I think it looked better with those letters personally. So there's our diamond. Okay, and then if you want to go back, you'll just click on edit envelope and then it will allow you to, you know, you can stretch it resize it, change the shape, you know, a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to move that to the side. Now I'll grab another circle. And in this case, give it a color. And I'll grab my initials and I'll put them in the center. Now, I know a lot of type enthusiasts out there don't like torturing text, um, but I will torture my text a little bit. What that means is I'm going to skew it, and I, I recommend doing this tastefully, so be careful with this that don't completely skew it so you don't recognize the characters. But if you go to your type and create outlines, in this case, I'm going to change the type color so you can see it. I'll bring it to the front so that you can see what I'm doing. Okay. So right now we'll keep it um, we'll keep it black so you can see. So I've got my text box. Now I'm going to go to Object, Compound Path, Make, and then I'm going to give it a color. There we go. So this is where I'm going to expand my text a little bit. And the idea here is to get the top and the bottom touching, just like that. So that's torturing text. When you stretch it and skew it to the point where it just doesn't, uh, it's unrecognizable. But this is kind of, it gives a cool effect, I promise. So you can stretch it, torture the type a little bit, and then you're going to um, copy the circle. So if you hit Command C to copy, and then Command F will copy it in place. And I'm just going to hide that second circle. I'm going to close off this eyeball here. And I am hide the layer. And then I'm going to send the text to the back layer. Bring the circle to the front. And then I'm just going to select both objects. Now, don't forget to expand your object because it, will, um, it won't give you that same... Oops, I forgot to select this circle. It won't give you that effect. So just make sure you've, you've done those proper steps. In. But this is a really neat way to kind of create another monogram effect. This is a little different. It's not distorted. It's not, um, this one almost looks like a bubble or like it's under a magnifying glass. But this one is just straight keeping the shape of 
whatever shape it was placed in. Now you can also round things out by grabbing your direct selection tool or you can uh, grab your anchor point tool and add an anchor point in there. You can round things out to kind of fill that circle. But I really like this look right here because I think this is kind of neat. Depending on what your initials are, but please be aware you're not able to edit the text once you've created it in outlines. So that's, that's the only you know, tricky part of this one, but uh, you can edit the text if you do the previous demonstration. All right, are there any questions before we go to break? We're gonna talk about a hierarchy when we come back and then kind of briefly look at the assessment and go over the, the steps of setting up the document. We may not get to the whole layout, but that's gonna be up, for, up to you to kind of figure out. We're gonna get to the part where you can place the, uh, the quote and get the body text in, but I really wanna see if you guys can follow the specifications, but yeah, pretty cool. All right, so we're gonna to go to a 10 minute break and we will come back and jump into the assessment next. So enjoy the, the extra minutes.
Okay, we are back and we're going to jump into the rest of our lecture real quick. So I'm going to close this out. And I wanted to talk a little bit about add hierarchy or layout and design hierarchy. So this is from an older class, but I wanted to show you what we talk about when we're referring to hierarchy. It's the most important information is at the top. And then as you move, so you've got your headline, which is usually the biggest element on the page. Then you've got your subheading. And then your copy is much smaller in relation to size. And then you've got your um, other information at the bottom. So this it represents an ad. So we're not going to get too much into that. But I did want to show you the importance of hierarchy. We're going to talk about contrast a little bit. You want color and size to, be, to bring interest. So it's got to be a big enough difference to create that contrast. Now here, this purple on green is not enough contrast to, um, I guess, make it legible and really stand out. You need more of a lighter color on a darker background. So that's in terms of contrast. But let's talk about hierarchy as far as where our eyes gravitate. So as you can see, as you're reading this example, your eyes go here, then here, and then here at the bottom. So because of the size of the font or the type, it's, it's basically the designer is telling the eyes where to go first and then where to go next. And so it's laying out the steps of where our eyes are being directed based off of just size alone. We're not even talking about the fonts that are being used. Let's look at this one. So again, we're talking about hierarchy. So the most important stuff's at the top, like the headline. Then you've got the subheadline or the byline. Then you've got the or the body copy. And so as you move down the list, you start seeing that there is uh, a lot of information that you can format in such a way that that it will get read correctly. So there is one thing I wanted to share with you, and that's the elements on a page. And let me see if I can pull up the graphic because I have a graphic I wanted to share. Give me just a second. It's uh, taking a minute. Hmm. Sorry, guys. All right. I will just throw it into a, see if I can drag it to the PowerPoint. See if it'll let me do that. No? Give me one second. It's, it's stalling on me again. There we go. Okay. Well, anyways, I'll just share the website so you can see the the picture because for some reason it's not letting me me do it. Anyways, with each magazine page. It consists of several crucial elements. So whether it's an article page like assessment three, there's images and text and all of those elements. And it's very important that we learn to lay them out correctly. So I will show you, I'm just gonna share my screen. There is a picture online, magazine sign here. Okay, so let's look at this picture for a minute. So elements of a page. So you have the running headline at the top. You've got the credits, which is your byline here below your headline. So look at how large your headline is in relation to your byline. The byline is very small. And remember you formatted the by I, uh, IU online or remember the byline that you did when you formatted things uh, last week or I think it was during week one. And then you've got your intro, which is usually a bolder, bigger than your body copy, but it's still very small in relation to your headline. There's usually an image. In this case, you won't have one. But look at this pull quote here. 
This pull quote is what they usually refer to as a, any information that they pull out of the article to grab the reader's attention. So if you read any magazines or you flip through, um, basically it is magazines or newspapers, you'll see lots of pull quotes for articles. And the pull quote serves two purposes. First one is it stands out as a piece of visual art. It kind of breaks up the heavy blocks of body text. And when you're reading a long article, it's just the eyes get overwhelmed and kind of don't even read if there's too much, if there's not enough visual things to break it up. So the pull quote adds that. And then the second uh, reason why we use the pull quote is it also helps draw the reader's attention into the article. So it also acts as a piece of art, but it serves a very practical purpose. Then at the bottom here, you've got your folio, which is usually the number the page number and then the name of the publication. You've got your subheadings, which are these little formatted subheads in between paragraphs of text. Now the rule, one of the 19 rules of typography is that if you're going to use a subhead, do not indent the first word of your first line of your paragraph. So Remember, if you do not use a subhead, you would indent the paragraph whenever a new paragraph starts, but it's kind of one or the other. So remember that rule because you'll be graded on that as well. Um, bylines can also go on the side of the page, but we like to keep them under the headline if, if it's at all possible. And then obviously image captions you often see whenever there's um, images used in newspapers or or even magazines. So this is basically the visual that we wanted to go over, but I wanted to share why it's important. And the main purpose of a headline is basically first and first and most important textual element on a page is the headline. So the headline is as important as the layout. So after the reader opens the page, first thing that catches his or her attention is the layout or maybe some dominant image. The second thing that will draw his or her attention and lure you into the reading of the article is the headline. Not only what it says, but how it's styled. And the reader might find the layout attractive, but if the headline's not appealing and interesting, the reader might skip it all together and just kind of move on. And that happens with us all the time. If we see something that's not interesting, we don't bother and stop to read it. So that's why headlines are very important. So let's go ahead and set up our document. And we'll kind of step through this with the last 30 minutes that we have of class. We'll see how far we can get into it. So if you click on the week three assessment, and Also, we, yeah, we're going to, choosing your fonts, basically we talked about font families and then picking a contrasting font to go with it, serif versus sans serif, this is going to be very important with your layout, I just want to make sure we were touching on this, and then mixing typefaces, so let's look at this slide real quick before we move into the layout portion. The contrast between them are, is going to highlight or subdue certain words or parts of the paragraph. So you want to make sure that you make the composition visually appealing with some contrast. So when you mix a serif with a sans serif, that is very complementary. And that's what we mean in the invitation when you're, de de let's see, designing the wedding invitation, you want to have to have two contrasting fonts. It's very important. You can mix use of a typeface and then mix and match weights and styles that also creates visual hierarchy. So that could substitute for two different fonts, but it, it also makes it easier to perceive and understand. And it also creates unity within your layout. Also contrasting display and neutral typefaces. Again, in wedding invitations, this is gonna be very important. You're gonna want a big, bold, styled display of a font, whether it's the monogram or whether or not it's uh, the text, but this is going to stand out if you compare it to the Humble Myriad Pro Lite. So less is more. Just try not to use more than two typefaces. That's the, that's the general rule. And then taking something pretty boring like this uh, phrase, may your Christmas be merry and bright and merry, and then styling it in such a way where you use interesting fonts that contrast with each other, but still are decorative and stand out. Even using two decorative fonts. So this is just really important to 
format. Now it all stands out. It's all exciting to read. It's, it's more interesting, I should say. So just kind of be aware that the way you lay something out can have an effect overall on the design. So let's go into InDesign. And I'm going to close out an Illustrator here. Now, did you already have InDesign pulled up? I'm also going to close out of the other program so that this can run a little faster. I'm sorry, there's so much lag. Okay, so making typesetting decisions. This is what our assignment assessment three is going to be all about this week. So evaluating how size leads uh, in tracking affects the readability of text. So we're going to create a new document, file, new document. In typography, it's often the small details that make the biggest difference, and that's going to set you apart as a, as a designer. So we want you to have well-trained eyes that will quickly pick up on uneven spacing or letting, incorrect hyphens, widows, and just the finer touches of using the correct symbols and glyphs. This is what sometimes is called practicing sensitive typography. And so that's why we're practicing this so much in formatting and using following along with specifications. So we've got our new document here. And you're going to want the size to be 8.5 by 11. This is a standard letter size. I do apologize for the wait. I'm sorry it's uh, taking so long. Computer is thinking. So what we're going to do using this InDesign, we're going to create the document with the following specs. So we're going to set up our 8.5 by 11 document. You, most of them are, are already defaulted to that. I'm going to uh, name this uh, DES113 underscore assessment 3, first and last name. You'll uh, want to make sure that your margins are correct. So if you don't see these options, there's drop-down menus. Just click that arrow right there. Top margin needs to be half an inch left needs to be half an inch and the bottom needs to be three quarters of an inch. So I'm going to break the chain here, which means I'm going to make, I'm not going to make all the settings the same because this needs to be 0.75. And then you'll want to set up for either two or three columns. I like three columns because it takes up more space meaning my text goes further if I'm trying to fill space or I, I have a short article that I need to fill space. The three columns allows me to do that. Two columns allows me to squeeze, if you have a lot of text, two columns helps me squeeze it all in. So three columns if you don't have that much text. So I'm going to stick with three and then I'm going to hit OK. I'll hit Create. That's all we need to do here. then it will go into its thinking mode. You're going to want to import or download the document, the text and Word document that they provide you under the assessment three. There's uh, two links to it. And then you'll click on it and then make sure you save it somewhere where you can find it. You'll import that into InDesign. Just make sure not to include the references. So I'll show you what, what I mean. I, this is basically a review from week one, but once you have your document in the three column set up here, I'm going to make sure my workspace is C 
set up properly. There we go, there's my toolbar. All right, so the first things first is setting up your, your uh, text boxes for your body copy. So I'm gonna get my type tool and I'm gonna click and drag and I'm gonna use these columns as my guides. And once I've drawn one uh, type box, I'm just gonna hold down my Alt or Option button. I'm gonna click and drag and I'm just making a copy of these text box. So I've made three, in, three uh, text boxes that are the same size, so three evenly spaced and the same size. Now I'm gonna click on the first text box and I'll zoom in here so you can see what I'm doing. At the bottom right of your first text box, there is an anchor point above the corner. You're gonna click that and you'll notice when you click it, a little blue triangle appears in the window. What this means is we're going to link our text boxes together so that no matter what text flows in the first box will flow into the second and the third. So after you click once on this anchor point, you'll click to link the next text box. Click that anchor point above the corner one and then link the other text box by clicking in the middle. Now that these are both linked, you can double check to make sure they're both linked, but you'll know when you highlight them, these little triangles in the anchor points show that they're connected. But you can also go to view and you can go to, um, let's see, show text threads, and these lines will show that these boxes are connected. If you don't want to see that, you can turn that view off. So go back to view extras, and then you can uh, go hide text threads. So now that you know that they're linked, um, you won't need to, to see them. So I'm gonna click in the first box, make sure my cursor is blinking. I'm gonna go to file, and I'm going to go to, um, let's see, where is place? There we go, file place. Go find the document that you downloaded. And I have a ton of stuff, so I'm gonna go to my downloads folder. Here's the text. I'm gonna hit open. And it's going to pull everything into those text boxes, but luckily we've already linked them, so it all flows in. Now remember, it says do not include the references, so we're gonna take those references out. And I'm gonna take the headline out by cutting it out. Command X will cut it. And I'm gonna draw another big type box right above it. That's gonna be where the headline's gonna go. And this is where I'm gonna make it nice and large. Nice and big, just like that. Now headlines can be bold. Anything that you feel will help it stand out. I'm doing, I'm using contrast in this case because the headline is big and it's bold, which is a nice contrast to the small, regular font style of the body copy. All right. We can work with spacing in just a minute. I want to format my byline here. So basically we want to set up paragraph styles for the body copy and the subheadings and the pull quote. So we're also going to choose alignment and column width that will make a comfortable read. General rule of thumb here is to use your left alignment on the body copy, okay? If you want to change for any reason, you can use maybe left justify, but I really like sticking with this left alignment. This is how newspapers and magazines and books. This is how they all format it. So there's no reason to kind of stray from the usual. Um, the byline can stay about the same size, but you definitely want to like set it, a, uh, set it apart. So italicizing it is, is crucial. It's also a good way of doing that. You can bring the headline down if you want. Um, but notice that we've got this big gap of space, so what we can do is either, we'll mess with the spacing in just a minute, but we've got subheadlines in here, like the digital reader. So this is where I'm going to go in and use a contrasting font. So I'm going to use Helvetica, just because it's a common font, and it's also sans serif, which will be a nice contrast to my serif body copy. 
And for the for the subheads, I'm going to make them a little bit bigger. So I'm going to make them about 14. Now, have you used paragraph styles before? The way to set up paragraph styles, and paragraph styles can be very helpful, that you, you format something once, and then you have it kind of saved for later. So I'm going to click this. All right, so basically when you format something, you're gonna click new, and this becomes your new uh, paragraph style. So this one's gonna be subhead, and you'll notice that when you highlight something that you've already formatted, you can go to basic character formats and it'll have it there for you. Look, it's heavy, Helvetica, this is the size, this is the letting, it kind of takes all the properties of that formatting and it saves it. So. If you see a subhead or, or, sorry, if you see a plus sign next to it, it means you've made a change since you've done something to it. Um, but this is my subheader. So if I go to the next subhead and click, I'm going to highlight the next subheader in my article and click my labeled paragraph style, it automatically formats that for me. So that's kind of cool, huh? If you need to go make a change, you'll need to make the change in the subhead formatting. So for instance, um, I don't want book to be on its own line, so I need to make the size a little smaller. So I'm going to bring that down to about 13. But notice how I'm changing it in the paragraph style options, and it's doing a live change for me as I'm doing it. So now as I'm shrinking the font, I can see what it looks like. So I like that a lot, so I'm going to keep that size, and then everything else can kind of stay the same for now. Uh, let's see, we also need to create a paragraph style for the subheadings and the pull quotes, and we will get to that in just a minute. So basically a pull quote is pulling a piece of the article and formatting it in such a way that will act as art and also to pull the reader in. So I'm going to grab uh, something that I find interesting. It can be a quote or it can be a section of the article. And I'm just going to grab this sentence right here. Now, a pull quote should be in its own text box because you're going to do some different formatting with it later. Now. I can choose to create a new paragraph style, and this one's going to be my pull quote. I'll label it as such so that it's easy to find. Go to basic character formats, and this is where I can make changes to it. I'm going to keep the sans serif font. I'm just going to increase the size, and I'm also going to make it italics, so it, that's another contrast. I'm using the same font, but the same serif font. I'm just using a different font style within it. Uh, I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger. And I can even change the color if I want. Character color. So instead of black, I think I'm going to do kind of like a, a blue or even uh, black. I can use do like a gray. Okay, and that becomes my pull quote formatting. And in here, I need to use quotation marks. So there's two different options with the pull quote. You can choose to either have it extend over two columns, or you can have it extend in one column. I don't recommend going across all three columns. I think that doesn't look as effective. So I would stick to the two columns or just maybe one column, depending on what you have space for. I'm going to do the two column thing right here. And you'll want to do a text wrap. And your text wrap is right up top here. And it's just going to wrap around your text. I'm also going to highlight my text and I'm going to go to uh, my paragraph, go to window, type in tables, click on paragraph. That opens my paragraph box. I'm going to get rid of hyphenate. I'm going to deselect that box. 
That way it takes off the hyphenated words. And I'm just going to kind of move this until things kind of are looking somewhat evenly spaced. I want to steer clear of text touching text. So I really want to make sure I have a good um, wrap around the object shape here. There we go. Now I think it would help before we start lining things up to snap everything to our baseline grid, to align everything to our baseline grid. What we need to do is remember that our letting is 12.6. So I'm going to highlight every all the body copy. I'm going to click on my InDesign preferences. We're going to go to grids. And we need to make sure that the increment every matches our letting, which is 12.6. And the view threshold, I'm just going to lower it to 25% so that I can see. If I hit OK, it should have everything pretty well lined up. I'm also going to highlight this and then go to my paragraph settings down below. And then instead of I'll do not align to baseline grid. I'm going to make sure that everything is aligned. So I'm going to click this icon, which aligns my columns. So now everything is lined up. And we can see what's going on if we go to View, Grids and Guides, Show Baseline Grid. This now kind of creates that notebook paper effect, but we can see that it's nicely placed at the edge of the blue line, and it's not um, – staggered columns of text. So everything lines up nicely. Now this view is a little bit busy for my taste. So once it's all lined up, I just hide the baseline grid so that I don't have to see it anymore. And my text or my pull quote is nicely placed. I could even make this a different color. Uh, I can go into my pull quote and I'm just going to go and change the color to something that stands out. Black and red are classic uh, combination colors. So I'm going to use a red, and we go back because I forgot to change the uh, opacity. So I'm going to bring that back to 100 just so it stands out a little bit more. So that pull quote acts as kind of like a piece of art. You can see that it breaks up the body of text really nicely. But the other thing that my paragraph is missing is usually a drop cap. There's always a drop cap to indicate where the article is going to start. So you're going to create a new layer. I'm going to double click on it to give it a name. This is going to be my drop cap. And then I'm going to go to my basic character formats to and some spacing. Let's see. Oh, drop caps. There we go. And then I usually like to drop it about three lines. That also helps take up space if you're hurting to fill space. All right, that looks good. I'm going to bring the headline down a little bit. Okay, so we've set up paragraph styles for our body copy, our subheadings, and our pull quote. Now we need to choose an appropriate typeface and style size letting and tracking for our headline, which we've done. Subheadings and then the body copy and the byline. So I've kept the byline the same font. I just italicized it. We also need to add a page number, which is the folio. Now, the interesting thing with the page number is, oddly enough, we won't go drawing a, a box and putting a number in there. There is actually a, a more professional way of doing it, and I want to teach you the right way because it's crucial when you move into the industry how to do this because if you were to work for a magazine or a newspaper or even a book publishing company, you don't want to be numbering a thousand plus pages or hundreds of pages manually. You're going to want an automatic way of doing this. So the way you're going to do it is open up your pages. If you don't see your pages dialog box, you can go to window and select pages. Just make sure it's checkmarked. If it's already checkmarked and you don't see it, look to the right where your panels are. My pages panel is open and now we're going to, to create our master page. So do you see this where it says A master here on the left? We're going to go to the right of it and double click it and it will highlight it in blue. That's how you know that you're on the right page. So right now it's highlighted in blue. It means we're on the A master. So we've got a blank slate right here. Everything that goes on the master page will also be applied to your entire document. If you have a left 
page master and a right page master, everything on the left page will apply to all the left pages. Everything on the right page will apply to the right pages. That makes sense. So in this case, we don't have left or right. We just have single pages. So what we're going to do is um, just do one page number. And the way that you do that, it's kind of cool that it's already built into InDesign, but it's an automatic feature where you grab your type tool. You'll just indicate where you want your, your folio to go. And I'm going to zoom in here at the bottom left. This is where I'm going to draw my box. Now you'll automatically know you're on the, you've got a master element on your page because the line, the outline of your text or object will change. So it's got this dotted line you can see that indicates you're on the master page. So it's a, just another indication showing you that you're on the right page. All right, with your cursor blinking in that text box, you're going to go to type. Scroll all the way down to insert special character. You're going to also go across to markers and then click on current page number. Now when you do that, you'll notice that a letter popped up, letter A. That's okay, right now it's a placeholder, but when you go to your page one and two, you'll notice that it's already numbered for you and I can continue to add pages to my document and it will continue to number them for me. So I've got the A blinking in there, I can format it, in this case, I'll probably make it a, uh, a sans serif font. I was using Helvetica as a contrasting font. And I'm going to bold it. And I'm going to make it nice and small. It does not need to be big at all. So I'm going to make eight, eight point font. I'm going to move it away from my margin line just a little bit because my text will end at my margin line and I don't want those numbers touching my text. Okay, so I've got my folio placed. And I'm going to go to page one. If you double click on page one on your pages panel, you'll notice how there's a one there indicated with the dotted outline. That means that that's your master element. If I go to page two by double clicking, it shows me page two. I can continue to add pages three, four, five. You'll notice how I'm adding these and the numbers are automatically being placed on the page. This is an excellent way to create continuity with your pages because everything is lined up. You don't have to eyeball anything and you certainly don't have to manually go in and change those page numbers yourself. So that's the neat part of this assignment or of adding a folio to your document. Okay, so we've got our number one labeled. Now please be aware that you will get docked points if you don't if you only label it manually. I really want you to get in the habit and know how to do it the right way. You won't be able to, you'll notice that you won't be able to click on the number when you're on page one because that is a master element. If you need to make an edit, you'll have to go to your master page, okay? So in this case, say, um, oh, I wanted a, a serif or I need to move it up a little bit, but it won't let you. You can go to the A master and you can make that adjustment from there, just like that. Now, if for some reason you're laying out a large document with hundreds of pages and you just want to change this page because it's the cover page and you don't want the folio on there, but you don't want it to apply that change to all the other pages, you'll just make that change directly to the page. And you'll do that by selecting the page you want to edit, right click, and then you can click override all master page items. And when you do that, it now becomes editable just on that page. Okay, so that's just another little trick as you're moving forward. You won't need that setting. It's just neat to know how to edit, basically. All right, and again, I'm going to go to paragraph, and I'm going to turn off my hyphenation on that pull quote so everything looks nice. And now let's see what else we need to do. So you're basically going to be graded on how well you addressed the typesetting standards. So uh, oh, and you need to include the name of the publication on the folio. So let's go back to the A master. The name of it needs to be typography. So I'm going to do a contrast here. I'm going to make this a a light. And I'm also going to kind of tab this over quite so dramatic, but kind of give a few spaces. 
or I can divide it by a by a divider line just like that and I can even kind of space out the letters a little bit I'm just trying to make it look like it was formatted this is not um, necessary but there we go so that is my folio. Now I can go click on page number one and it's already there. It's already formatted for me. So this is my footer. And um, basically you're just gonna be graded on how well did you follow these instructions. Now, if you were at the end of the article, you formatted everything, you snapped, you turned on your baseline grid, everything looks good and we've got this empty white space. The way I like to fill it is by selecting all of the text boxes. And I'll just grab the bottom ink anchor point. Oops. You zoom in. And I'll just pull it up one line at a time to kind of see what it does. Because I'm trying to close the gap there. Um, I could also see if I move this down, my pull quote, if that helps fill in any space. And I don't like that as much, so I'm going to back up there. I also noticed my word flexible is down here all by himself, so I'm going to move this so that it doesn't uh, separate the word. I'm just going to kind of go in here. I'll select each text box. And I, and I don't, what I don't want to see is the headline by itself. I want to make sure that there's no text up here. I want to make sure everything's even. So I guess that's the best we can do. So I'm going to move this down. All right, so you've got your formatting. Now, are there any questions before we I'm going to before we jump into the other part of our lecture? I just want to make sure we're all feeling good about this. Okay, there's another way you can format it. Uh, let me show you. I'm gonna take this just like the example, and I'm gonna put the byline in its separate text box. I'm gonna move this up. And in this case, I'm not gonna let the headline extend all the way. I kind of shrink it down. I'll center align the headline, and I'll also center align the byline. Just like that. All right. I don't want it too disconnected, so I'm not going to separate it too much. I'm also going to take this pull quote and I'm going to extend it in the middle here between these columns. I'm going to center align it. Just like that. I'll pull this in. So one way that you can create really nice clean edges over the paragraphs is by putting a box behind it and then you can kind of text wrap that. Um, I'll show you what I mean. If you grab a box, and this is going to be a white box, and I'm going to text wrap the box. I'm going to right click, bring this to front, and then if you ever need to change something because it's not, if like the headline now is being text wrapped, so the text is moving away from it. I'm going to click on text frame options. 
ignore text wrap because I just put a text wrap on that white box. So now I can kind of bring it down. And I've got even amount of space up top here. I'm going to turn this off to none. Okay, perfect. And that helped me close my gap down here a little bit. So that was nice. Okay, so, so far everything is looking good and that is all I really need to do for the three column, uh, th three column grid. Now notice how I kind of closed off that big white gap. That is uh, kind of what I'm gonna be looking for. I don't wanna see too much white space there. So play around with your quote. If you need to even make it bigger to fill that space, you can do that too. So in this case, I'm going to select my boxes and I'm going to hold down shift and just kind of expand it. And notice how it just automatically pushes the text around. So kind of just play around with, with spacing. You don't want a huge gap in the middle. You want it to be pretty tight still, but I really like this. Um, I think this is a good formatting for, for the article. It's very clean and everything looks pretty evenly spaced. I've got my folio there. So when you're done, it's now time to export it. So you'll go to File, Adobe PDF, and you'll click on Smallest File Size. And then you'll create the PDF. Now please note, we need your original design file in order to, to get a, a good grade on it because I need to be able to verify that you set up your paragraph styles. That's one thing I'm gonna be checking and also your baseline grid. Um, I also wanted to point out that if you have trouble, if you are trying to fill space, another trick uh, is to highlight your body copy. Go to Window, click on Type in Tables, and then Paragraph. Deselect hyphenate, and that automatically gives you a little bit more space to play with. So you can kind of do it that way. Except I don't want the there would be too much gap between the headlines. So and just kind of play around. You'll have to mess around with your columns a little bit and see depending on if you used a two column grid or a three column grid. But please make sure to include the PDF and the InDesign file because I need to verify style sheets. But both are going to be needed for the assignment. So once you go to File, you'll go to Adobe PDF Presets and Smallest File Size is what you'll click. And that will save to wherever you usually um, get your PDFs. You'll upload that to the class, to the grade book, and then that's it on the assessment. So, so nothing too groundbreaking here. This is pretty similar to what we did week one and week two. But again, this is just a good refresher. And it's just going to kind of gauge whether or not you can follow typesetting instructions. And uh, look at the examples too, so make sure you're doing it right. If you guys have any questions, you can come see me in the multi-session because I really want to be able to help you before you submit your assignments. This is pretty crucial, I think. Um, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit more about these elements before we close out. So let me pull this back up. Just so that you understand the purpose of these elements, I think it's important to know. So we've got our headline here, and, and you know that headlines can vary in size. We had one going across the page, and now I've got this one just centered a little smaller on my page. And the importance of the article really determines the headline size. So I'll talk about headline treatments you know, later at an, in another tutorial, but positioning, the positioning of the headline is also vital, and you should aim to place your headlines at the top of the page. They're never at the bottom, they're never in the middle, it's always at the top. This is the place where the eye will go first. So many times I've seen headlines placed at the bottom, and for me, this is just really bad design. There's no reason why a headline should be down there. And not always, but it rarely works, but place it at the top and give the headline importance that it deserves. And the headline should be set in the bigger size regarding all the other text elements on the page. So it is the biggest text element on the page, as we can see. There's also the intro or the kicker. You could format that. You could make this the introduction or this the introduction if you wanted to and make this the intro or the kicker. And usually the intro or kicker is stylized differently. It does not have a drop cap, so we would have to remove that. Um, and it's usually a little bit 
bigger, but uh, it's just kind of sets the, the kind of summarizes the article, but um, we won't, we won't do that this time around, but that is an option if you wanted to. Um, as you can see, there's many names for this type of element, so I prefer to call it intro. That's what we called it in the newspaper um, in, this, or in the magazine industry that when I worked, but when I worked for a newspaper, we also called it the kicker. So either one is fine. It sets the tone of the article. It just briefly summarizes what the article's about, kind of draws you in a little bit. The intro text should summarize the story to attract the reader's attention, so that's what that job is for. Now, you know body copy is regarding all the text in the article. This is the largest part of any article. Body copy should be as interesting as the design. Um, so if you have a very interesting article or story, you really want to design your layout accordingly. So what's the point of having great design and headline if the content isn't good? But that's not really our job to write the content necessarily. But designing the body copy is the first thing that we should do when we're designing the templates for the magazine or for an article or for a newspaper. So setting the right margins and the columns and the size of the body copy can really affect its readability and usability. So just wanted to throw that out there. Pull quotes are very useful. They're attractive design elements and I love to play with them a lot. So you should work with your copy and kind of pull the most interesting parts of the story and emphasize them. That's the point of this. All right, guys, we're all out of time. So I'm going to stop the share here. We'll close out. Are there any questions before we end? If not, I thank you for hanging with me and I look forward to seeing all your assignments. Come see me tomorrow at the multi-session and uh, bring your questions. I will see you guys later. Thanks, Ben. Have a great night.